Peace, peace, peace. This is your international sales and marketing villain, Tiger Toledo. And you already know what it is, man. You rock it with the best. You heard? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Vector Sales Academy. I wanted to give you guys a quick introduction on who I am, why am I doing this, why did I get into sales and marketing, and what you can expect to earn. Okay? So, let's get right into it. First of all, who am I? I am a first-generation Haitian-American. Uh, some of the notable Haitian Americans that you may know of is Wyclef Jean from the Fugees, Zoe Saldana, uh, my main man Usher Raymond, Jason Derulo, and Blake Griffin, just to name a few. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Now, if you guys lived in New York around that time, it was a phenomenal time, right? Hip hop was really making its way. I grew up, I, I was born in 75, right? But I was there, for, you know, really understanding where I lived in the 80s and 90s. I moved to Chicago in the late 90s. So growing up in Brooklyn was phenomenal. We had hip hop, I mean, hip hop was making its way, really smashing through the door creating some amazing amazing platforms for and jobs and employment for people that didn't have you know employment so it was creating some tremendous careers for people um, of course the females were gorgeous out there they had their little door knocker earrings if you if you know a girl from the inner city man you know she is just fly from top to bottom and another thing was that Crime was at an all-time high, unfortunately. So when I was growing up, um, they called Brooklyn, Brooknam. The same way in Chicago at a time, they used to call it Chirac because of the violence and stuff. But at that time in Brooklyn, they called it Brooknam. And there was a lot, a lot of killings. But at the end of the day, Family still had to support themselves. So my mom, she was a home attendant. She worked for a company out of Jamaica, Queens called Personal Touch. And she would help take care of elderly people, right? And she did this for years, for years. And a lot of people in New York, you know, especially foreigners uh, that don't speak a lot of English, they tend to go into fields like this. So... She did this for years. She would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, get me ready for school. 7 o'clock, we're out the door taking a four train on Utica Avenue. I'll get off to go to school. She'll keep, continue to go to work. And I would not see my mom until 11 p.m. So if I developed a, a strong work ethic, it would probably be from watching her, from her putting in those many hours. Okay? So, I remember there was this one time, and this, this incident changed my life. There was a one time we went uh, to a training in Jamaica, Queens, at her job, and she would always take me to her training because at the end of the day, she needed me to translate a lot of the stuff that they were talking about because she didn't understand English completely well. So, after the training was over, a uh, young gentleman, I don't know, he might have been Italian, he might have been, you know, uh, Hispanic, young cat, spiky hair, had a nice little brown suit on and stuff. He asked my mom to come into his office. So we went into his office, sat down, and he said to my mom, we have noticed that it's been pretty difficult for you to make appointments and run appointments like you needed to or take care of the elderly like you used to and if you guys know where this conversation is going you guessed it 
they gave my mom the pink slip. That is the first time I've ever seen my mom cry in front of a stranger besides when my mom, when my older brother died. Um, I watched my mom break out in tears while this other guy was on the other side. Now, growing up in the inner city of Brooklyn, of course, what I wanted to do was jump over the table and just beat the living crap out of the dude, right? But I understood right there and then what was happening because my mom was getting sick. Her diabetes was beginning to take a toll on her. And she wasn't able to move and run and, you know, hustle the way she used to. So she, I remember distinctively her crying and asking the guy, like, please, no, not right now. I have my child. Um, how am I supposed to take care of my child? And I never felt more helpless in my entire life. I never felt more helpless in my entire existence. There was nothing I can do for my mom. I didn't have a skill. I was probably, I was 15 years old at the time. I didn't have a skill. I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know any plumbing, construction, drywall, or anything like that. There was nothing I can do. I just felt completely helpless. So when we left, uh, Jamaica, Queens, we went back home. Of course, my mom's crying on the train ride back, and, you know, I'm trying to console, say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Eventually, you know, she filed for uh, public assistance, and we went on welfare. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't the cool thing to be walking around with food stamps in your hand. It's different now. It's a different era now. People have link cards and EBT, it's just, a, it's like a credit card. You swipe it, there's no really, but back in the days, in the 80s and 90s, you had to count these phony looking dollars for food. And there were people in the neighborhood that would look down on you and be like, oh, well, but needless to say, you know, heck, my mom had to do what she had to do to put food on the table. As my mother's health deteriorated, I became an alumni of HSD. And if you don't know what HSD is, I became an alumni for high school dropout. I dropped out of high school to take care of my mom, right? So I knew I had to scramble. Now, my mom was back and forth in the hospital, so there was a lot of time I was home by myself. There was no parental uh, supervision. My oldest brother, because I have two brothers, he was addicted to crack cocaine. So you can imagine that, that I'm not relying on that guy at all. If anything, he's coming to steal shit out of the house. So a friend of mine, his name was Micah, and salute to that brother. If I ever meet him again, I'll thank him a million times over. He was friends with people at EMI Records. He got me a, you know, a little bit of an internship, kind of, I guess they felt sorry for me or whatever because of what I was going through with my mom. And they got me into, you know, do a, a small little internship with EMI Records. At the same time, they got me a job working at Tramps, the nightclub uh, in Manhattan. I was about 16 years old working in a nightclub, which was, of course, unheard of. And, but I wasn't serving liquor or anything. They had me working at Coat Check. And twice a week, they would call me to um, assist one of the other Coat Check girls. She was studying to be an actress. Who knows if she ever became... She wanted to do soap operas. I remember that. So, boom, we went into... I went to do Coat Check. And in two hours of work, I was able, minimum, $150 a night. And I worked about two nights a week, so about $300 and up. Right there, I was introduced to, like, a new concept, like, wow, you can make more than 
eight, nine, ten dollars an hour. And I think I, back then minimum wage was like maybe six, seven dollars or something. But to make one hundred and fifty dollars for two hours, I really didn't understand what I stumbled on. But I was getting some money to a to be able to help out my mom out. So during that time, I had a crash course in marketing, sales and promotion. And I was able to meet people like D'Angelo, Groove Theory, Wu-Tang Clan, Bahamadia, and the Fugees. And I got to go backstage. I got to pick their brain. I got to see what they were able to do to be able to sell as many records as they did, to sell out shows. And I mean, their shows were jam-packed like beyond capacity you couldn't even get in and what they were able to do to sell market and promote themselves 